All right. I'm back and settled in from my trip to Paris. There's so much to digest, but I'm just going to talk about some main takeaways, including my phone getting stolen on the metro. First, I've always wanted to go to Paris. There's a handful of places that I absolutely want to go to because of their massive role in Western civilization. You know, you have your Rome, Athens, Florence, London, Paris, Berlin, Amsterdam, Cairo. And we always say we're going to get around to it. And then the years pass us by. As you're aware, I'm a big Bucks fan and Giannis follower. And if you want an explanation why, listen to episode 16 of this podcast titled Greek philosopher Giannis Antetokounmpo. It was announced they'd participate in the first ever NBA game in France. So I booked my flight in late August and really didn't think about it until, until January. Uh, but if I was ever looking for a reason or opportunity to go to Paris, I mean, this is as good as ever, right? Besides the game, there were a few things that interested me in particular. I really wanted to visit the Museum des Orsay. I think that's how you say it. I don't know. That's how I say it in my head. Des Orsay. It's an old train station converted into a museum that houses mainly Impressionist works and art from the late 19th century. And the story of the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists absolutely fascinates me. In a book I read, um, I can't remember what the name of it is, I stumbled upon Dear Theo, it was mentioned, and it's the autobiography of Vincent van Gogh. It's actually his, his letters to his brother, Theo. Theo and him were very close. Theo would often sell his art, or, or I should say, try to sell his art. And these letters are quite beautiful and inspiring. And since reading it, I've added an item to my 50 before 50 list, because of course I have one. And it's take a photo with every publicly displayed Van Gogh self-portrait in the world. And so there, there are about 30 altogether. There are six of them in the United States. So far, I've knocked out three of them, New York, DC, and Chicago. And the Museum des Orsay displays two of these paintings. The Impressionists were this group of painters that used short brush strokes to capture the essence of a subject rather than literally painting it. And so the popular art of the day was a lot of these neoclassism scenes and painting aristocratic families. The Impressionists were looked down on in Paris, and so critics just trashed their work. So there's this guy named Durand Ruel who was an Impressionist art dealer. So he was basically the guy that was trying to sell the Impressionist works. And he would try selling their paintings all around Europe to no avail, going broke several times in the process. But to his excitement, it now only took one week to cross the Atlantic. I mean, can you believe that? He was excited that it only took one week to cross the Atlantic now. It only took me eight hours to do that. And so when he, he would come over to the States, he would bring over a handful of Impressionist paintings with him. And he would also bring over a ton of what was considered popular and mainstream at the time. America, at this time, was quickly becoming one of the most powerful and industrious countries in the world. It was prosperous and ambitious. Unlike Europe, they didn't care about the old. The Americans wanted something new, something to make a statement. So this bold nation wanted to set its own mark in art. So they come over and they would see these Impressionist paintings and they'd be like, yo, you got more of this? And then Ruel is like, yes, I do. Boom. Off we go. And you can make the argument that modern art stems from Impressionism. So the Museum des Orsay was pretty cool. I enjoyed that. The building itself is super neat. I can see why people fall in love with Paris. I didn't fall in love. I don't think I like French culture. It's about enjoying the moment, pleasure, opulence, luxury. I imagine it truly began during Louis XIV's reign. So this is the 17th century. And in addition to gaining power through military, he intimidated and overwhelmed people 
with his fashion and flamboyancy. Each year, this dude spent half of France's GDP building his palace, Versailles. That's incredible. So in order to get close to the king, you had to dress and dine a certain way, only the finest and most luxurious. And so the people on court would literally go into debt to pay for jewelry and dresses to wear at his parties, and they took their loans out from the king. So the king is double dipping at the same time. It's quite brilliant, actually. And the culture, I think, has carried through the years to today. And so Paris is a fantastic place to vacation for that reason. I consumed nothing but coffee and wine and pastries and everything was delicious. But I don't, I don't think I could do that for more than a week. One of the things I wanted to do most was work out my third book over there. But not just be inspired, finish it. I just wanted to go to cafes and work. And that's certainly not the culture there. The cafes are, are tight and filled with people having conversations. And I think it says a lot about the difference in cultures. In America, the coffee shops are spacious with big tables, Wi-Fi, outlets. But it was kind of a struggle uh, to find places like this where, where I could work effectively, but I got it done. Book three is with my editor now. The working title is called Inner Colors. It's an art book. I think the whole situation is kind of reflective of the Impressionist story. You know, Americans want to push new ideas and they want to work to put them in action. And the culture is much more open in that sense. On that Sunday though, I was making my way to this Palace of Versailles where Louis XIV is spending half of France's GDP. And I'm on the Metro and I transferred lines and I was standing in a crowd. I decided I wanted to listen to some music. I mean, who doesn't want to listen to Harry Styles on a late Sunday morning? Until this point, I'd been putting my, my passport and wallet and phone all in my, um, my tighter front jeans pocket. At this moment, I placed my phone in my loose coat pocket, and then I, I reached inside my coat for my headphones, and I, you know, I spent time untangling them, untangling them. Then I stuck them in my ears, and then I, I reached for my phone, and it wasn't there. Huh. So I, I, I padded, padded down all my pockets. Huh. Interesting. I felt confused more than anything, really. But in life, it's not the event itself that affects you. It's your reaction. My phone was stolen. It happened. Take care of the next steps and move on. So I got off the train, I went to a cafe and I used their Wi-Fi to suspend my phone line and change my Apple password. Side note, this place had the best croissants I've ever tasted in my life. After this cafe, I walked to the police station, filed a report, moved on with my day. And it was kind of strange because I felt lighter and, and almost like more attentive and able to notice and experience Paris in a, a more observant way. So I finally got my phone. It's been about a week and a half since it happened. Um, and it, it took me so long because I really wasn't in a hurry. It's been quite enjoyable. I've been so relaxed and free. I, you know, until this point, I've been reducing my phone use and practicing being more intentional and mindful about how I use it. But Paris just removed my training wheels. And it allowed me to take a step back from life, reflect, and it spurred new ideas, actually. Is it strange to be grateful for a thief? The person thought they were taking from me, but instead, they've given me something far more valuable than the inconvenience of a stolen phone or the cost to replace that said phone. I don't need it. I've been able to still do everything that I need to do with my iPad and laptop. 
I use those purposefully every time I use it, right? Because your phone, on the other hand, is in your pocket at all times at your disposal. It promises you you'll never be bored again as long as you give your life to it. Our phones have incredible tools that, when used intentionally, can bring us tremendous benefits. However, though, if we're not careful, we become the tools. Thanks for listening to Rich Conversations. Have an impactful day.